It's gone, so if you had ordered a t-shirt or you wanted a t-shirt, make sure you get those today, probably preferably the... Hey guys, you guys are in for a treat. We have uh, Dan Gear here today to talk to us about, I don't even know what you're talking about today, but it's always interesting. Um, Dan is actually uh, really a luminary in the security industry, and I've actually known Dan for close to 12 years now. And a lot of people know about his work at you know, Project Athena, building Kerberos. A lot of people don't realize that it was also under Dan's watch as director of engineering and open market in the mid-90s where they invented this little thing called the internet shopping cart. And also um, one of the first implementations of a web-based session management system that we all kind of take for granted today. So Dan's been in the field for a long time. He'll be the first one to tell you that he started out in another field and came to security, but he's been doing security for quite a while and always has interesting deep thoughts on that. So please help me welcome Dan Gear. come to a podium, the first thing is, where can I set down a glass of water and not destroy what else is going to happen? Uh, I appreciate the invitation. Um, it probably doesn't need to be said, but uh, just for the record, I'm speaking for myself. Um, those of you who know, I'm the Chief Information Security Officer at Incutel, uh, which is the um, strategic investment arm of the U.S. intelligence community. Uh, but let me just be clear as a matter of disclaimer that I'm speaking for myself. Um, which is to say any errors are mine and so forth and so forth. Um, as Rob said, I've known him uh, a long time, um, or what seems like a long time now, and uh, I know quite a few of you in the room as well. Um, I don't mind heckling, but I've got a lot to say, so we'll see how this goes. But I don't mind heckling, by the way. I actually don't. I, I've often said what I like best. Uh, I like nothing better than a, than a technically hostile audience, so uh, I suspect... Uh, some of you know how to do that. Um, we're getting older. The alternative is worse. Um, were, were this a formal debate, the title would be the assertion, Resolved, the Internet is no place for critical infrastructure. I say that in part to get your attention and in part to open a line of thought about what is critical and the degree to which that which is critical is defined as a matter of principle and the degree to which uh, that which is critical is defined operationally. That is to say, I'm distinguishing between what we say and what we do. Uh, mainstream media and bloggers alike love to turn the spotlight on anything they can plausibly call hypocrisy, the dictionary meaning of which is as follows. The act or practice of pretending to be what one is not, or to have principles or beliefs that one does not have, especially the false assumption of an appearance of virtue. The debate topic I'm proposing um, can therefore be restated as simply calling hypocrisy on the claim that the internet is a critical infrastructure, either directly or by transitive closure with the applications that run on or over it. If it were, the divergence between our beliefs and our practices would be necessarily narrower. It is possible that in writing this talk that I am in part echoing how a free-range cattleman felt about the coming of barbed wire roads and land title to the American West. The great cattle drives of the West lasted about 20 years before other kinds of progress made them impossible. Commercial internet traffic began 20 years ago last summer. Douglas Adams in the posthumous book the Salmon of Doubt, described our reactions to technologies as follows. One, anything that is in the world when we're born is normal and ordinary and is just a natural part of the way the world works. Two, anything that's invented between when you're 15 and 35 is new and exciting and revolutionary, and you can probably get a career out of it. Three, anything invented after you're 35 is against the natural order of things. <laughs> um, I admit all that <laughs> um, and more, but recalling Winston Churchill's that the further back I look, the further forward I can see, it seems to me that either the wide open range that is the freedom of an internet built on the end-to-end -end principle must die, or else we must choose to not allow the critical infrastructures of our lives to depend on that internet. By now we have all the evidence we need to show 
that confidentiality, integrity, and availability for data or systems does not occur by magic, that it must be designed in, in the first place, and it must be renewed often. Designed in, as bolting it on after the fact has been shown uh, to generally fail, renewed often as designing anything to be entirely future-proof is, far, is so far from easy as to be unlikely. The so-called Hobson's choice is where the, one is given a take-it-or-leave-it proposition, which is said to be not much of a choice at all. Although I suspect this applies to no one in today's audience, consider the Internet as a Hobson's choice. You either get it, warts and all, or you leave it. You get nothing. Last Friday, the Pew Foundation published a report that talked about the so-called digital differences in the U.S. As they point out, one in five American adults does not use the Internet. Among adults who do not use the Internet, half said that the main reason they don't go online is because they don't think the Internet is relevant to them. Though, all, though over net, overall Internet adoption rates have leveled off, adults who are already online are doing more. For Pew, this is another examination of the so-called digital divide. But I think that it is something to consider in a different light. For those 10% who, presented with a take-it-or-leave-it proposition regarding the Internet, choose leave it. It does not register as a desirable and may for some of them be an undesirable. As it happens, I grew up without television and have honestly never myself bought or owned a television. I suspect that there are a few in this room for whom the Hobson's choice with respect to television has also been or has become leave it. So far as I know, there's no social opprobrium, no implication that you're a loser if you opt out of television. It is merely a choice. Such a choice entirely frustrates a whole swath of advertisers, no doubt. And since the majority of the money given to politicians this election season will doubtless be spent on television buys, one might even say that the refusal to participate in television delivers a mildly antisocial side effect, especially if it is the television ads that actually elect the next president. If your choice to leave television out of your life is so that you can be consistent with an organized set of moral beliefs of which avoiding television is only one, then there are many sophisticated observers who will immediately suggest that you have been in some way brainwashed. Nevertheless, other than that fraction of the cost of anything you buy that is attributable to the carried forward advertising budget of its manufacturer, you can be rather independent of television and live a good life. That 10% of the population that doesn't see any reason to bother with the Internet is surely similar to whatever fraction of the population doesn't see any reason to bother with television. As with those opting out of television, whatever the Internet rejectionists, that's a word I will use, whatever the Internet rejectionists buy will include the cost of Internet advertising bought by the manufacturer, but surely that is all. Surely they can refuse the Internet and have that be just as it sounds, something that they choose not to do anything with and therefore inconsequential to their life, the way television happens to be inconsequential to mine. Not so fast. We are at the point where it may no longer be possible to live your life without having a critical dependence on the Internet, even if you live at the end of a dirt road but occasionally still buy nails or gasoline. Unlike television, where at most choosing the president or deciding what colors are in the spring collection, you cannot entirely unplug from the Internet even if you want to. If you are dependent on those who are dependent on television, then so what? If, however, you are dependent on those who are dependent on the Internet, then so are you. Dependence with respect to television is not transitive. Dependence with respect to the Internet is. The source of risk is dependence, and especially dependence on expectations of system state. My definition of security itself has co-evolved with my understanding of risk and risk's source to where I today define security as the absence of unmitigatable surprise. The absence of unmitigatable surprise. It is thus obvious that increasing dependence means ever more difficulty in crafting mitigations. And, increase, and that increasing complexity 
embeds dependencies in ways such that while surprises may grow less frequent, they will be all the more unexpected when they do come, and come they will. Because dependence on the internet is transitive, those who choose leave it with respect to the internet only get to say that in the first person. They are still dependent on it unless they are living a pre-industrial life. That rejectionists depend on people who are not rejectionists is simply a matter of fact, a fact in the same way that the sun rises in the east is a fact. Every, everyone has a stake in this game. At the same time, the rejectionists do have some specie of impact on the internet happy, something more substantive than not buying G-Jaws from internet marketeers. To the extent that we are willing to admit it, the rejectionists are now a kind of failsafe. If we begin to penalize the rejectionists, that is to say, to force them to give up on their rejectionism, we will give up a kind of societal resiliency. What do I mean? Well, let me illustrate this at a personal level. I have a 401k invest, um, retirement account. The account is with Fidelity Investments, a Fortune 500 firm that is, in fact, within rifle shot of where we are. In the past few months, I have learned that Fidelity no longer accepts client instructions in writing. They only accept instructions over the internet or as a fallback for the rejectionist over the phone. They simply do not accept the canonical wet ink signature on bond paper. I've sent them paper letters. They have responded in email that says what I just said, though I should note that I never gave them my email address and wouldn't have if asked. The, that the main response on Fidelity's side is their auditors approve of their scheme. The main response on my side is, so what? Which is, of course, my way of saying that Fidelity's auditors work for them, not me. It will doubtless not surprise you that the email letters do not contain a digital signature. And in any case, what is the equivalent of a digital signature for a phone call? Mind you, Fidelity still sends paper statements and to the same mailing address from which I have been writing. The second personal example. I choose to not do internet banking. It's simply a choice. I use a small local bank, one that is far, far from being too big to fail. When they announced the availability of online banking, I sent them a letter stating that as I would not be using that service, then I would appreciate it if they would turn off access to my unused account, or at the least, to raise an alarm if anyone ever tried to use that account waiting in my name. To their eternal credit, they agreed without argument. That is not the norm. Try, as I have, to tell that to the part of ADP that runs the Get Your W-2 online service called iPay. One might consider that a company unwilling to turn off your potential access because you asked them to do so is a company which does not, in fact, in operational fact, care about your security. If you will not use the account set up in your name, then you are sure to not notice that someone else has begun to do so at least as long as your money and data seem to be still intact. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. I don't care if ADP is sure to be outstandingly prompt in sending me a data breach notice and or buying me three years worth of credit watch were someone to use the ADP account prepared for me. I care that it is made inoperable. I care that I not have to have a dependence on ADP's inner security, however good that may be. If there are any Estonians in the audience, you are by now sure that I am quite mad. For those of you who are not, Estonia is perhaps the most internet-dependent country, a fact that has certainly worked well for them on balance. Quoting from an article this past Sunday in The Guardian, 42 Estonian services are now managed mainly through the internet. Last year, 94% of tax returns were made online, usually within five minutes. You can vote on your laptop. At the last election, the president of Estonia did that from Macedonia. And you can sign legal documents on a smartphone. Cabinet meetings have been paperless since 2000. Doctors only issue prescriptions electronically, while in the main cities you can pay, for it, pay by text for bus tickets, parking, and in some cases a pint of beer. Not bad for a country where two decades ago half the population had no phone line. Central to the Estonian project is the ID card introduced in 2002. 
9 and 10 Estonians have one, and by slotting it into their computer, citizens can use their card to vote online, transfer money, and access all the information the state has on them. There's nothing on the, this is a subquote, there's nothing on the ID card itself because that would be dangerous if you lost it, says um, Katrin Pargme, who is in charge of public awareness at the RIA, the country's internet authority. It only gives you access to the database if you type in the right code. You can also present the card at the pharmacy to pick up your prescription. On public transport, it doubles as a ticket. Many people also have special ID chips on their mobile SIM cards that allow them to pay people by text. Now that's the Guardian quote, and that is entirely impressive. And as the article suggests, a degree of Estonian pride is entirely in order. That degree of dependence happens not to be for me. I want to retain the ability to opt out of most direct dependence on the internet. That is to say, opt out of that dependence, which is the root of risk. I mean that as stronger than a preference, but weaker than an ultimatum. In a free society, that which is not forbidden is permitted. In a non-free society, that which is not permitted is forbidden. The U.S. Supreme Court is presently reviewing whether the Congress can forbid the citizen to not have health insurance, that is to say, whether the government's monopoly on the use of force can be deployed to collectivize the downside risk of illness. That is not an option I favor, but just as forcibly collectivizing the downside risk of illness has proponents, so too does forcibly collectivizing the downside risk of internet dependence. Just as Estonia is well ahead of nearly everybody in productive dependence on the internet, so too is China well ahead of nearly everybody in forcibly collectivizing the extent and manner in which the internet is available to Chinese users. As sovereigns, the former is Estonia's right, just as the latter is China's right. I want neither, even though I must acknowledge that as nations decide on their particular mix of dependencies, the internet will be dramatically balkanized. The internet will never be again as free as it is this morning. I spent a decade and a half working in Harvard teaching hospitals, especially the Beth Israel Hospital. On November the 13th, 2002, a total computer outage began at the Beth Israel. The initiator was inadvertent high volume data transfer amongst researchers. The impact was reverting to paper for four days. The event was severe, unexpected, and recovery was frustrated by complexity. During those four days, doctors and laboratory personnel over the age of 50 could effortlessly cope. Most of the rest could not. Put differently, that fallback to manual systems was possible is what saved the day, and it was those who could comfortably work without network dependence who delivered on that possibility because they had done so at earlier times. Let me now state the central thesis of this talk, and it is this. Accommodating rejectionists preserves alternate, less complex, more durable means, and therefore bounds dependence as a society. Bounding dependence is a rational core of risk management. Everyone here who has worked in systems administration knows that redundancy enables uptime guarantees. Everyone who has been in the sysadmin game for any significant time also knows that if you don't detect when that redundancy is busy saving your bacon, then you will soon be in big trouble. If I only need four out of five systems to be running, uh, then the failure of any one system will cause no effect. If, however, I don't notice that I've had that failover event, then any subsequent failure is non-recoverable and a surprise. One of the principal arguments for hot standbys is that when the failover has to happen, the equipment to which the failover is directed is known to be working. Ten years ago, Bill Lefebvre gave a Usenix talk on the operational changes driven by the impact of 9-11 on the web presence of the cable news network, better known as CNN. In it, he described how as demand spiked, they shed load, but in the case of CNN, shedding load meant taking say, the Cartoon Network servers, and repurs repurposing them on the fly. These days, there are probably lots of VMs and clouds involved, but the idea is the same. 
that having hot standbys beats having a spare unused capacity any day, since amortizing the cost of the hot standbys through, say, running the Cartoon Network on them is financially sound and, which is more, it guarantees you know the hot standbys work when the failover becomes necessary, such as when there is an order of magnitude spike in demand for news. They did, by the way, have an order of magnitude spike in under an hour. Anyone who has ever found that their emergency generator didn't start when it needed to also knows what I'm talking about. So has anyone who has ever gone to one's backup media only to discover that they are blank. Summing up so far, risk is a consequence of dependence. Because of shared dependence, aggregate societal dependence on the internet is not estimable. If dependencies are not estimable, they will be underestimated. If they are underestimated, they will not be made secure for the long run, only for the short. As the risks become increasingly unlikely to appear, the interval between events will grow longer. As the latency between events grows longer, the assumption that safety has been achieved will also grow, thus fueling increased dependence in what is now a positive feedback loop. In the language of statistics, common mode failure comes from underappreciated mutual dependence. Quoting from NIST's section on redundancy in their High Integrity Software System Assurance documentation, redundancy is the provision of functional capabilities that would be unnecessary in a fault-free environment. Redundancy is necessary, but not sufficient for fault tolerance. System failures occur when faults propagate to the outer boundary of the system. The goal of fault tolerance is to intercept the propagation of faults so that failure does not occur, usually by substituting redundant functions for functions affected by a particular fault. Occasionally, a fault may affect enough redundant functions, functions that it is not possible to re reliably select a non-faulty result, and the system will sustain a common mode failure. A common mode failure results from a single fault or fault set. Computer systems are vulnerable to common mode resource failures if they rely on a single source of power, cooling, I.O., etc. A more insidious source of common mode failures is a design fault that causes redundant copies of the same software process to fail under identical circumstances. That last part, a more insidious source of common mode failures is a design fault that causes redundant copies of the same software process to fail under identical conditions is exactly that which can be masked by complexity precisely because complexity assures underappreciated mutual dependence. Which brings us to critical infrastructure and the interconnection between inter uh, critical infrastructure by way of the internet. For the purpose of this essay, I will use the definition found in Presidential Decision Directive 63, as issued by then President Clinton. Critical infrastructures are those physical and cyber-based systems essential to the minimum operations of the economy and the government. Note that wording, essential to minimum operations. That does not read as a requirement that the armor deflect all bullets, only that no bullet be paralyzing. One of the great Allied victories of World War II was getting 338,000 soldiers off the beaches of Dunkirk using 800 little boats a paragon of the phrase essential to minimum operations as none of them are warships in any formal way. If defined in its technical sense, the internet is a network of networks, not a single entity, that the majority of its main protocols were designed precisely for fault tolerance and for the absence of common mode failure has been proven out in practice, perhaps nowhere as spectacularly as when Bill Cheswick and Stephen Brannigan mapped Yugoslavian networks during the NATO bombardment in the spring of 1999. Those main internet protocols worked so well that innovation blossomed simply because the internet did not depend on the flawless functioning of every one of its moving parts. It was not designed, however, for resistance to targeted faults, which, as Laszlo Barabasi showed, cannot be done at the same time as you are designing for resistance to random faults. 
In an internet crowded with important parts of daily life, the chance of common mode failure is no idle worry. The Obama administration is committed to increasing dependence on the internet on two fronts, either of which might be said to be themselves essential to the minimum operations of the economy and government. First is the press for electronic health records. Second is the press for the so-called smart grid. As with most garden paths, there is nothing wrong interior to the arguments for electronic health records or for smart grids. Both have eminently useful results for which a desire is entirely rational. Both illustrate my point. With respect to electronic health records, their utility depends on the smooth functioning of electric power, networks, computers, displays, and a range of security features that we can discuss another day, particularly as it relates to maintaining consistency across multiple practices. With respect to the smart grid, its utility depends on almost everything we know about power, including the absolute necessity of good clocks, a wide range of industrial controls operated flawlessly at a distance and guaranteed to not lie about their state, and another range of security features we can also discuss some other day. Because both of these involve new levels of exposure to common mode risk, some of which are risks electronic health records share with smart grids, they will add new failure modes to the world, to the world we live in. On good days, both will deliver far better, more cost-effective benefits than that which we now have. On bad days, the reverse will be true. And as the Beth Israel example proved by demonstration, doing without those benefits will be easier for those who can remember not having had them. Put differently, each new dependence raises the magnitude of downside risk, the potential for collateral damage, and the exposure of interrelationships never before contemplated or understood. Forget the banks. It's the Internet that is too big to fail. While there is no entity that can bail out the Internet, there is no meaningful country that is not today researching ways to disrupt the Internet use of their potential adversaries. The most a country can hope to do is to preserve the Internet interior to itself, as Estonia demonstrated while under attack from Russia. Of course, at some level of transborder interconnection, the very concept of interior loses meaning, just as every one of you here knows when you have had to explain perimeter defense to a new client or counterparty. Now let me hasten to add that where ignoring the risk is negligence, a sin of omission, purposefully inflating the risk is fraud, a sin of commission. As Dene Florencio and Cormac Hurley showed in their 2011 paper at the workshop on the, internet, on the economics of internet security, the estimates we have of the impact of cybercrime are all but surely universally inflated. The sin of commentators who may have been able to merge omission and commission. This is an important point, enough so that a shortened form of the Weiss paper appeared only last week in the New York Times as an invited op-ed. I've come to the conclusion that part of what makes a good security person is some sort of intrinsic fascination with failure. I am certain that designing for tolerable failure, meet mo toler tolerable failure modes, is precisely what security engineering is fundamentally about. If I am right, then the failure mode you did not think of will not be in your design, and therefore, whether it is tolerable will depend on many things, perhaps even the phase of the moon. The question then is whether tolerable failure modes can be themselves designed. That is to say, whether a failure mode never before possible can be added to the system to its benefit. No country, no government, no people need rules against things which are impossible. Obviously, the onrush of things never before possible creates vacua, where, in the fullness of time, there will have to be rules. As the current mayor of Chicago put it in his characteristically blunt way, the creation of rules is easy in a time of crisis and therefore 
one must, quote, never let a good crisis go to waste. He is right as a matter of observation. He is wrong as a matter of probity. Just as driving under the influence of alcohol is wrong, so is making policy under the influence of adrenaline. The lawmaking of the last decade is illustrative, but the point is hardly new. Eleven years before he became the fourth president of the United States, James Madison said that, Perhaps it is a universal truth that the loss of liberty at home is to be charged provisions against danger, real or pretended, from abroad. One wonders how Madison would feel about an interconnected world where abroad has so thoroughly lost its meaning, at least with respect to internet-dependent critical infrastructure, if not national frontier. Six weeks ago, more or less, I gave a speech asking whether people in the loop are a loop for security, are a fail-safe or a liability. I won't recount the arguments, but I will give the conclusion that a good security design takes people out of the loop, except when it cannot, and when it cannot, it is clear that this is so. I gave two examples. The first, my previous employer was Vertisys, where I was chief scientist for the product design team. For those with a deep background, our product was a distributing, distributed recording version of the Orange Book reference monitor implicated, impl implemented as a rootkit. That said, we could do nearly anything to detect and modify data handling of any sort at any granularity. We installed in a major hospital. There, the chief of medicine demanded that under no circumstance could our product block access to patient data since who knows what sort of emergency might be in progress. At the same time, the general counsel demanded that under no circumstance could our product permit a breach of regulatory control on data handling. The solution to this standoff was that whenever someone asked for data that was nominally forbidden, a pop-up window would appear which said, against policy, click here to proceed. <laughs> With that, no data was denied, but at the same time, no person could deny having intent. The finesse this represented, the well-placed insertion of a tiny bit of sentience in an otherwise fully automated prediction re regime worked and continues to work. The other example, I have good relationships with a number of, of large banks. One of them has long since made user-level provisioning a completely automated process. The automated provisioning control includes deprovisioning, what you might describe as removing Dan's access within 120 seconds of the time Dan submits his letter of resignation, or for that matter, slugs a managing director on the trading floor. Fast, hands-off, one-button deprovisioning makes regulators happy. It makes general counsels happy. But it's a nightmare if it goes into a loop. The bank I'm thinking of has coded for this explicitly. If 50 resignations have come in within an hour, the deprovisioning system halts and will not proceed until a human gives it the authority to begin again. Putting a human back into the loop has saved their uh, bacon at least once. These are examples where putting a human in the loop, that is to say, falling back from automation, has proven to be a breakthrough finesse. Both were designed that way. Neither was an accident. And both required a real labor to get everyone on the same page. In such an outcome, something that can, is such an outcome something that can only be done on a case-by-case -case basis, something that cannot become part of a security discipline in the large, something that avoids both sins of omission and sins of commission? One hopes that it can be. There is simply not time to make every security-related decision go through the path that those two examples propose. The public at large is not and cannot be expert in the way this audience is expert, nor should it have to be. That the public has, shall we say, volunteered its unused computing power to botmasters is nothing so much as an historical mirror of how press gangs once filled the rosters of the British Navy. But how is that altogether different than a formal mandate that if they have medical records, they shall be electronic, 
or if they receive electronically electricity that the metering regime is a surveillance tool. How is it different that finding that compliance auditors have certified to the regulators that there is no need to accept a signed paper letter detailing the wishes of the financial client, wishes that those self-same regulators demand the financial client formally submit if the financial institution is to be protected from tort uh, uh, claims? I've come to the conclusion, as recently have others, that security is a proper subset of reliability. The logic is that security is a necessary but insufficient condition for reliability. As such, connecting the insecure and thus unreliable to the important and expecting that melange to be reliable is utter foolishness. As Marcus Ranum says, a system that can be caused to do undesigned, thing, undesigned things by outsiders is not reliable in any sense of the word. On that, report, on that point, I do refer you all to the work being done by Sergey Bradis, Meredith Patterson, and others whose startling insights deserve full quotation. The language theoretic approach, or LANGSEC, regards the internet insecurity epidemic as a consequence of ad hoc programming of input handling at all layers of network stacks and in other kinds of software stacks. LangSec posits that the only path to trustworthy software that takes untrusted input is treating all valid or expected inputs as a formal language and the respective input handling routines as a recognizer or compiler for that language. The recognition must be feasible and the recognizer must match the language in required computation power. When input handling is done in an ad hoc way, the de facto recognizer, that is to say, the input recognition and validation code ends up scattered throughout the program, does not match the programmer's assumptions about safety and validity of data, and thus provides ample opportunities for exploitation. Moreover, for complex input languages, the problem of full recognition of valid or expected inputs may be undecidable, in which case no amount of input checking code or testing will suffice to secure the program. Many popular protocols and formats fell into this trap, the empirical fact with which security practitioners are all too familiar. Viewed from the venerable perspective of least privilege, computational power is privilege and should be given as sparingly as any other kind of privilege to reduce the attack surface. We call this the minimum computational power principle. We note that recent developments in common protocols run contrary to these principles. In our opinion, this heralds a bumpy road ahead. In particular, HTML5 is Turing complete, whereas HTML4 was not. So far as I can guess, nearly nothing we have in our cyber interfaces in critical infrastructure meets the LangSec test. Because of that reason, if no other, attaching the cyber interface of critical infrastructures to the internet is a guarantee of error. As always, the error may be improbable, but probabilistic events do eventually occur. If we are unlucky, those events will not be prompt. In a conference panel, I was once asked, what malware would I write if it was not a question of labor or difficulty? My answer remains the same. I'd find a way to make the occasional odd modification to the formulae in your Excel spreadsheets. And I would embed this malware in the spreadsheet itself so that any sharing of the spreadsheet would propagate my malware. As Excel formulae are probably the world's single most prevalent programming language, in a period of time, I would desynchronize all copies of what are ostensibly the same document. That would not end the world, but think for a second about how derivative pricing is actually done. If I could do this, for which I have neither skill nor desire, then I might even be properly called a terrorist insofar as terrorism is a means of coercion by way of spreading fear. At this point, I am at serious risk of being exactly the kind of fear monger that quickly becomes a fraud. That is, of course, not my point. 
My point is that the working definition of critical infrastructure is broad and which is more, it is indistinct. There's been much talk about whether to grant the president a so-called kill switch for the internet. There is considerable logic to that if you accept what I have been saying, namely that in the presence of interdependence that is inestimable, there may be times when it is not possible to disambiguate friend from foe. Were someone on an inbound airplane to be found uh, to have smallpox, the passengers and crew would be a quarantine as a matter of public health until such time as each of them could be separately certified as disease-free. Many important enterprises, public and private, oystered communities such as the Amish. We tolerate them. I expect that if a food crisis of some sort were to materialize, it is the Amish who would be the least affected. We have amongst ourselves so-called neo-Luddites. In some sense, the Luddites had a more principled analysis than the Amish. They knew where the machines would lead, and on the basis of their analysis, they acted. The Amish merely wished to be left alone, such as to remove their children from compulsory education at the close of the eighth grade. So far as I know, their case, Wisconsin versus Yoder, is the only such case to ever reach the U.S. Supreme Court, which found in their favor. I ask, is there room in our increasingly wired world for those who choose merely to be left alone, in this case, to choose not to participate in the Internet society? Do those who do not participate deserve to not have their transactions of all sorts be exposed to a critical infrastructure dependent on the reliability of inter Internet applications as a class? Paraphrasing Melissa Hathaway from her 60-day review of U.S. cyber policy for President Obama, the United States' ability to project power depends on information technology, and as such, cyber insecurity is the paramount national, national security risk. Putting aside an Internet kill switch, might it be wise for the national authorities to forbid, say, Internet service providers from propagating Telnet or SSH v1 or other protocols known to be insecurable? If not that, should cyber components of the critical infrastructure be forbidden to accept such connections? There's, cer there's certainly a debate topic in that, if not a natural policy. As with most things, there's an historical echo here as well. In 1932, the foremost commentator of the age, Walter Lippmann, told President Roosevelt to his face, the situation is critical, Franklin. You may have no alternative but to assume dictatorial powers. Again, when 10% of, of the population sees nothing in the Internet for them, should we respect and ensure that, as with the Amish, there is a way for them to opt out without choosing to live in a hovel? Should we preserve manual means? I actually say yes. And I say so because the preservation of manual means is a guarantee of a fallback that does not have a common mode failure with the rest of the interconnected, mutually vulnerable Internet world. That, that this is not an easy choice is the understatement of the day, if not the year. I cannot claim to have a fully working model here, but neither do our physicist friends yet have a unified field theory. With my colleague Mukul Parikh, we run the Index of Cybersecurity. It is a survey-based index of sentiment modeled on the consumer confidence and purchasing managers' indices. It has been in operation now for a year. The respondents are all CISOs and like individuals whose view of cybersecurity is based on direct operational responsibility for their firm's piece of the networked world. It is a risk index, which is to say that when perceived risk rises, so does the index. Over the course of this past year, the index has risen inexorably, reflecting the view of experts at least as good as those in this room, that in the aggregate, risk is accumulating, and in much the same way that burnable timber accumulates on the eastern slope of the Rockies. Because the index is composed not of one question, but of 20, each asking about one or another source of risk, such as malware, activism, counterparty interconnections, and so forth, we have found that the steady rise in the index itself is not dominated by
by any one subcomponent, nor even is the ordering of the influence of the subcomponents on the overall index stable and unchanging. One month it is counterparties. Another month it is the impact of diverting security budgets to compliance. In yet others, it is malware that is indetectable by any of the array of commercial products for malware detection, and so forth. These are your peers, and they are speaking, and they are saying that the risk is growing. They also make comments, many of which are in so many words talking about irresistible commercial pressures. Against such a formal, metrics-based backdrop, I can confidently say that we, the security industry, are not running fast enough to stay in the same place. If, if those respondents and I are not fooling ourselves, preserving fallback is, a, is prudent, if not essential. That does not mean, per se, that the preservation of manual means is an easy out. It may well be that, as various Department of Defense thinkers are now saying in public, that our goal can no longer be intrusion prevention, but that must now turn towards intrusion tolerance. As before, this is easier said than done, but if we are to practice evidence-based medicine on the body internet, it may well be that expensive therapy is not always the answer. Perhaps one of you can come up with a cyber analog to quality-adjusted life years and help us all decide when to treat and when to plain just avoid. As you well know, 100% availability can be achieved by either driving the mean time between failures to infinity such that nothing ever breaks, or by driving the mean time to repair to zero, such that failure consequences are de minimis. I'm old enough to remember that rebooting a machine for prophylactic purposes was what system administrators did. These days, most people view a reboot as proof of failure. I don't agree. Summing up again, risk is a consequence of dependence because of shared dependence, aggregate societal dependence on the Internet is not estimable. If dependencies are not estimable, they will be underestimated. If they are underestimated, they will not be made secure over the long run, only over the short. As the risks become increasingly unlikely to appear, the interval between events will grow longer. As the latency between events grows, the assumption that safety has been achieved will also grow thus fueling increased dependence in what becomes a positive feedback loop. If the critical infrastructures are those physical and cyber-based systems essential to the minimum operations of the economy and government, and if aggregate risk, as estimated by leading cybersecurity operational management, is growing steadily, then do we put more of our collective power behind forcing security improvements that will be for each player personally diseconomic, or do we preserve fallbacks of various sorts and anticipations of events that, if the index of cybersecurity can be believed, seem more likely to happen as time passes? Does that old Yankee saying, use it up, wear it out, make it do or do without, have any guidance for us? Is centralizing authority the answer, or is avoiding further dependence until we can fix things the better strategy? Can we imagine starting over in any real sense? Or is balkanization not just for nations, but for critical sectors as well? Is the creative destruction that is free enterprise now to be encouraged to remake what are normally the steadying flywheels of American society, by which I mean government and its most capital-intensive industries? Does the individual who still prefers to fix things that he or she already ha owns to be celebrated or to be herded into national health information networks, smart grids, and cars that drive themselves. Remember that the internet was built by academics, researchers, and hackers, meaning that it embodies the liberal, cum libertarian, and cultural interpretation of American values, namely that it is open, non-hierarchical, self-organizing, and leaves essentially no opportunities for governance beyond protocol definition. Anywhere the internet appears, it brings those values with it, treating censorship as a routing failure, say. Other cultures, other governments, know that these are our strengths, 
and that we are dependent upon them. Hence, as they adopt the internet, they become dependent on those strengths, and thus on our values. A greater challenge to their sovereignty does not exist. A greater challenge to our sovereignty than mutual dependence does not exist either. There's never enough time. Thank you for yours. Don't forget to fill out your feedback forms, and the next sessions are going to be upstairs on the fifth floor.